going to uh, record the classes from now on, and we'll see how it goes. We'll experiment uh, today and see how it goes. I'll upload it to YouTube and take a look. And as long as it's somewhat workable, we'll keep it up there. Um, I don't know how the mic picks up, so, um, you know, we'll, we'll see, you know, if it picks up ambient noise or, or whatever. Uh, I will try to get in the habit of repeating a question if someone asks a question or makes a statement in class. That way, if the mic picks me up better than it picks you folks up, then uh, we'll be good to go. All right, um, what we're going to do is um, look at the example that we started last time and continue it and, and do some different things with it. Um, last time, if you recall, uh, the example was to do a simple temperature conversion from Fahrenheit to centigrade. And really the point of this assignment is to show how the form controls work and show sort of the form process. And we'll take a look at that and we'll, we'll review what we already have and then we'll start adding some stuff to it. Um, let's see. Also remind me to resize the, the text in the, in the code, which is a good idea to do anyhow, regardless of if we're recording or not. That way you can see it better. All right, so here's the example we had, and I'm going to run through it once, and then we'll look at the code. I'm go, just going to run through it um, in debug mode, then we'll look at the code. So I'm going to open up Visual Studio. Remember, we need to open up the folder as a unit. We're not going to open up individual files. And the folder that I pulled down from Angel is this temperature one right here. So I'll go into Visual Studio and open Website. Click on it. And Open. The way this works is when we run it, we will get our form, which in this case is only a text box and a button. We go and we type in our temperature, and it shows us that 32 degrees um, Fahrenheit equates to 0 degrees Celsius. A couple things to re uh, re review about this from last time. Um, I did the styling pretty much like I do the styling on a basic web page. I went into the HTML code and applied a, a style sheet and, and so on. In that regard, it's important sometimes to know um, what the HTML that's going to be generated is. You know, we can always take a look if we're not sure what the HTML that got generated is. So in this case, for example, I might want to make the labels a consistent size. That way uh, the, the things line up. And I could probably add some padding and all that. Um, again, you know, we can, uh, you know, you can spend uh, time to make it look like a complete web page as opposed to just having the controls plopped on the page. The other sort of lesson that we talked about is not trying to do everything at once. Uh, notice we want a drop down eventually that will allow us to convert either direction from centigrade to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to centigrade. All right? But it's not essential that we do that in the first pass. All right? um, and that's my advice for, for any program that you encounter is to not try to do it in one swoop. It's very difficult to do that. Even folks that are experienced, it's very difficult to do that. The reason is, again, you know, if you have a mistake in 50 lines of code, it's harder to find than if you have a mistake in 10 lines of code. And if you get 10 lines of code working and you add 10 more and something stopped working, you have a pretty good chance uh, that is in those 10 that you added. I do appreciate the fact that they decided to cut the grass today so that we can see just exactly how loud a lawnmower will sound on these microphones. So, good timing. 
uh, I'm waiting for I'm waiting for the person uh, pushing by the world's squeakiest cart that that seems to be following my classes around, and, and and we'll see what time they come by today. All right, so let's go in here. I'm going to punch up the style a little bit, but again, I'm not going to obsess about the style. But I am going to pay attention to it. So I'll go in, let's make this code a little bit bigger. And I'll put in, for a label, I'll give it a width of, eh, let's say, 200 px. That is, it is cut, it appears like it's cut off a little bit in the recording when I typed in as label with 200 px. And I'm going to give the li a padding of 5 pixels. By the way, uh, you, you do know that you can download the examples. Um, so if, if in the recording or uh, otherwise, you uh, want to, you can always go in and download the examples and see exactly what I did. Let's run this down, make sure the appearance is a little bit better. And we got our padding, we don't have our width, probably because the label is a inline tag. Therefore, I need to say... display inline block. Inline block means it will sometimes act like an inline tag, sometimes act like a block tag, insofar as you can set the width. Because you can't set the width of an inline tag, but you can set the width of a block, of a block tag. This is sort of the magic bullet for me. All right? Whenever I have something that doesn't work because it's an inline tag, if I change the display type to, to uh, inline block, it, it typically does work. All right, and sure enough, it holds true. Okay, that's good enough now. Again, we could we can make this look better if we wanted to, but at least, again, it illustrates my point of the mechanism that you go and apply CSS to this, and the fact that in this class, regardless of what I do in subsequent examples, know that a page should look like a complete web page. It doesn't have to be elaborate, but it should look like some attention was paid to the way that it looks. All right, let's look at the code behind now. And the code behind for this is based on the button click event. All right, the button click event is what's going to happen, uh, is going to cause this to happen. And remember that these are all server side events. So this code will run when the button's been clicked and the server has been called. Now, in the case of the button, that's a, mute, a moot point, right? Because if it's a submit button, then clicking the button will send a request to the server. So if you click the button, this code will be called because it is a, uh, again, it's a submit button. We saw the example last time, though, where we had an auto postback. Uh, we had to set the auto postback property of the uh, drop-down, all right, because simply changing a drop-down normally doesn't send it back to the server, all right, and therefore the item changed event didn't fire off until we went back and, and, and set it um, so that that drop-down uh, had auto post back. At any rate, what we're going to do, and um, if any of this is unclear, Please raise your hand, slow me down so I can explain it in more detail. All right, if I'm going too fast or whatever, please do that. When the button is clicked, the, clicked, the first two statements set up a couple of variables. All right, um, variables again are storage locations where we're going to put something and we're going to put something in there so that we can do something to it later. And in this case, we have to define the type. Uh, really, in, in all cases, in Visual Basic, when you declare a variable with the dim statement, you have to declare the type of the variable. This is what's known as a strongly typed language. Whereas, you declare a variable as being a certain type, 
and you can only put data of that type in it. That's contrasted with JavaScript, which is a weekly type language. And weekly type languages sort of just figure out what type of data you have based on the kind of data that you put into a field. So if you put in something like 9 slash 8 slash 2011, um, you can treat it like a date. All right? The trouble that you get into in weekly type languages is essentially it guesses how to handle the data. It might not guess right. All right? Or it might allow you to put in something into a field that you're going to treat as a date that actually is not a date at all. You get around a lot of those issues by virtue of having a strongly typed language. So everything in the language of Visual Basic has a type associated with it. Uh, arguments to functions, return values from functions, variables. And that's exactly what we're doing here. The dim says create a variable. DBL temp is a double for the temperature as double. That allows to put decimal places in here. I'm sure it either in the text or in, uh, online you can find a chart that explains what all the variable types are for numbers because there's integer and double and all that. I, 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 I'll be honest and say I can't remember off the top of my head the exact specifications of what all the variable types are. But the idea is, is we make that uh, a, uh, a variable because we're going to put something in and we're going to use it later. I like by uh, the naming convention of putting in a, a little prefix to the variable name that indicates the type of data. All right. In my mind, um, what conventions you use in programming are less important than the fact that you use some conventions. All right. So in other words, if you don't want to put in the type of variable as a prefix in front of it, that's fine. But do things sort of consistently is probably my, my piece of advice. All right, so the first two statements decla declare a couple of variables, a couple locations. Question? Yeah, what is that as double statement? As double means we're creating this variable. This is the name. As double means that that's the type of data that we're going to put into it. All right? Let's look. Let's do a quick Google to find out what a double means. And bb.net. So I can give a precise definition. This is a 16-bit number or something like that. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> a, a double data type provides the largest and smallest magnitudes for a number. All right? It is actually eight bytes of data and it's double precision floating point. And it gives values ranging from negative 1.7 times 10 to the 38th or 308th power uh, all the way through um, and it shows this other thing. So you can, you can put a wide range of numbers in. So that's why I do that. It might be overkill in this case. But the bigger issue is that whenever you declare a variable, you have to say what type of variable it is. If I'm going to put letters in it, I have to declare it as a string. If I want to treat it as a date, I have to declare it as a date. Doesn't it limit the memory? I mean, it's limiting the memory size, so you're not eating up too much resource. Well, uh, what, what's the back? The background reason for so what? So if you did it as an integer, it, it actually would be setting aside more potential memory. Not necessarily, no. No, not necessarily. Um, the, the reason that it forces you to declare it again is that um, if you don't declare the type of a variable, the compiler or the runtime engine has to guess. And it could guess right or it could guess wrong. All right. By explicitly saying that, it knows, gee, if I try to do something like this, It knows that that's wrong, I think. Actually, you know what? It's, it's taking a shot at converting it. Let's do this. So you can run it, it'll be there. Yeah, I'll, I'll get a runtime error. But the bottom line is it helps in, in doing that. If you declared option strict and option 
uh, explicit, then it would show it as a compile error. All right. But anyhow, that's what the as means. It's a type of data. And we'll see, anytime we declare a variable, we have to declare the type associated with it. <coughs> Double is just a number that can be a big number, and it can contain decimal points. So that's, that's what I usually use to put a number in, because I know, like with integer, there's, there's a, a definite uh, range, and it can't get bigger than that, and, and so on. Decimals in a and you can't have decimals in an integer, of course. I think it does actually um, take a larger amount of storage uh, space than we were just covering it in C sharp. What takes a larger storage a space? Um, well, a couple things to keep in mind. That's C sharp. All right. Secondly, yeah, I would suppose a double would take up more space than an integer would. I, I think you are asking the opposite. If an yeah, integer took up more space, no. If anything, a double takes up more space. Because a double is 8 bytes, an integer, I doubt if an integer is going to be a total of 8 bytes. All right. What does this instruction do? This instruction takes the value out of the text box called temperature. Let's look at that text box. Let's go into design view. Here's our text box that is called text temperature. Can't really see it here, but it is called text temperature. All right. Those controls on the page are objects. They're components. What does that mean? That means that there's actually a bunch of values associated with it. And we can write our code to change any or access any of those values or change any of those values. All right? So we can't simply say this. Oops. We can't say take double temp equals C double text temperature. Text temperature is a text box control. A text box control has a lot of things associated with it, right? It has a position on the screen. It has a background color. It has a font. It has a lot of different things. What are we interested in? Well, obviously we're interested in the value of the text box. So the pr property for that is text. Yes? I was just going to say that those are all properties of the... Those are all properties of the object, right? Characteristics of the object. Yep. All right. So what we're doing, that text temperature dot text, what it's doing is it's pulling out of the text box the value that we put into it, the value that the user has typed into it. And it's stuffing that in a variable called double temp. We then do this calculation. All right. Just like in mathematics, the parentheses indicates uh, an alteration of the normal order. So we're going to do the parentheses first, then we do the multiply, then we do the divide. And it's going to store the result in a variable called double result. Normally, addition and subtraction come after multiplication and division. So multiplication and division come before addition and subtraction. There's a few other things in there too, but for the purposes of this one, those are the two that we're interested in. So we do that calculation and store the result in double result. And then we take, convert to string that result and stuff it into the label. Just like with the text box, we can't say that label results equals that, right? Because the label's a control, the label's an object. An object has a bunch of properties associated with it. So what do we want to change about that label? We want to change the label's contents, and that's the text property. All right. So let's run through this again watching and paying attention. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set debug mode on for this. And we'll actually watch the code. We run it initially. Okay. 
the form loads and the controls have the properties that we set via the, 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 when we created the form, when we designed the form. So the temperature doesn't have any, the, the text box for temperature doesn't have any text in it. Um, the button has a, a name of convert or a value of convert. The result simply has the text of label. That's a little sloppy. I should probably clear that out. All right. So the form gets displayed the first time with the default values of that form, the stuff that we set when we created those controls and created those properties. Now, we go in and we put a value in, click Submit. That's going to send it back to the server to process. All right? So it's back to the server, and now it's running through the button click event because it's back to the server, and that button was clicked. So we're going to grab the text of that and stuff it in this variable. I'm hitting F11 to step through it. So now if I put my mouse over that, I see double temp has a value of 212, which is what the value of the text box was. Hit F11 again. Double result now has a value of 100, which is correct. And then I'm going to take that result and put it in that label. And I'm all done. And there's our label with the result in. Now, notice something that might seem trivial, um, but it's not. Notice that that temperature text box still has the value of 212. All right? It stayed at 212, even though we went to the server and back, and we recreated the web page. Now, the technical term for this, or the technical expression for this, is these controls maintain their state. They remember their values from the previous submission. All right? Now, you might not think that's a big deal, and those of you that are used to desktop programming would say, so what? Right? But if you've done programming in other web languages, such as PHP, you know that's not the case, typically. Typically, you have to remember the values of those and repopulate them. But here, the ASP.NET framework, one of the things it does is it remembers that the user put 212 in there, so after it refreshes uh, the page, after it goes back and recreates the page, it puts the 212 back in there. So any changes that are made to the properties stay, you know, until, you know, either the page is done or the, uh, you know, there's some code or something else that changes them. So that's sort of the cycle of form processing. The empty form loads. You put some stuff in. You click submit. A submit event <coughs> fires off. A button click event, typically, in, in our scenario. That event does something. It takes the values from the form and does <coughs> some sort of calculation or other manipulation and then displays the results. The controls all have the values, and the controls remember the values um, that they previously had, uh, the previous pass-through. Uh, that is, they maintain state. So that's sort of the form cycle. All right? Empty form, user fills in the form, clicks submit, code runs on the server to do something, and then display the result. And then we can repeat that cycle again. I could put in another value, click submit, all right? It will go and resubmit it, redo the calculation, redisplay the results, and so on. All right. Now, a couple things that we're going to talk about uh, now is we're going to add validation to this, right? Because we could easily break this by typing in something that wasn't a number. If I got cute and typed in a temperature of cold and click convert, yeah, it doesn't know, oh, well, it's in debug mode now, but it doesn't know what cold means, all right? It can't convert cold to a number, so it can't tell me what cold is in centigrade, all right? So it gives me an error. By the way, if you notice, these error messages are typically disabled in a, a running web application. You would not want to expose your code to the outside world by showing this descriptive of an error message. The only reason it's showing uh, me the code is because it knows that 
I'm running on the web server. I'm developing this application and my client is also the server. So it knows that I'm in development mode so it can display that. There are configuration settings in the web config file that can control this, but typically you don't want extensive error messages like this to go out to the outside world. All right. So at any rate, yeah, something's wrong. It can't do that. So we need to put in we need to put in something to validate for that. As we talked about before, there's a whole set of validation controls, all right, that we can go and, and we can put in, all right. In addition to giving us an error if, if something is uh, of, the, of the incorrect data type, it will also give us an error if we don't put anything in. So if I just click convert, it also gives me an error. So I'm going to put some validation controls in to validate the type. All right? And I'm going to do do it this way. One thing I do in this class, or I try to do in this class, is, is mix the way that I code, sometimes in the graphical view, sometimes in the code view, simply to give you uh, the chance to, to see it done both ways. Um, keep in mind that, um, that there's, you know, there's several ways that you can do anything, but in my mind, some things are just like easier to do in one view versus the other. All right. And what I will often do is I'll often just put it out there in the graphical view and then I'll go to the code view to sort of fine tune it and, and get the style located where I want it to be. So let me go in and I'll put a validation control for a required field. So I'll go and I'll put that there, required field validator. And with the required field validator, there's a couple properties that we need to set to configure it. The first property is an error message. We probably don't want to say required field validator. We want to say you must enter a temperature. And we have to say what control we're validating. So this down here says control to validate. And we have to pick that we are validating the text box for temperature. Now let's go and look at the code. All right. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add That should be CSS class. I'm going to say CSS class equals air temp. What that will allow me to do is put some style in my style sheet for air temp and get it to look the way that I want it to. Could you make that oh, sure. Thanks for reminding me. So could you review that again, what you just did? I just went in and added an attribute of CSS class okay. to that. And what that will allow me to do is to go in here and say... And that's in, inside the required validator of that? Yes. Okay. Um, what CSS class did I assign? I assigned error temp. So I can say error temp. And I can, I don't know, do whatever it is I want to do with that. I could uh, style it however I want to. Set the positioning of it. Could set the position of it. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to think through exactly what I want to do to that. Um, if you wanted to make that yeah. custom, 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 custom style or whatever, yeah. I'm actually going to put this.